cortisol levels. Yes. If the patient has high cortisol levels, how, what do you do to bring those levels down? Well, it's a little, it's complicated because we want to explore the reason for it. And usually there's a problem with something in their life. Okay, that's the number one reason. So whether it be dealing with, with psychotherapy or recommending meditation or exercise or a change in lifestyle, but there are supplements that can be given to help support the adrenal glands. For example, there's ashwagandha and there's PS100 and, and uh, there's something called Adricor. And so there are things that you can do to support the adrenals, but it's not all about just you know, throwing medications and supplements at, at someone. We really have to look at the whole picture. So yes, 100 plus the title series? Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, so. Yes. So um, the first thing I usually do is if a woman has low libido and, um, you know, is I'll, I'll start with re replacement. If we choose to, we, we will replace with the estrogen, the progesterone first. Because if, if you might recall the stereogenic pathway, testosterone, progesterone is actually a precursor to testosterone. The other way you can support testosterone is DHEA. So both men and women can take DHEA. Uh, or pregnenolone and support their androgens, which are the testosterone um, parts. However, if, if that just does not work, we can supplement with testosterone much, much, much lower doses than in men. Usually men will give 25 to 50 uh, milligrams. In women, we're talking about, I'm sorry, 25 to 50 grams. In, men, in women, we're talking about two to four. So uh, very, very small amounts. Um, so, and that's usually a combined, you know, put in a, in a cream and a compound because they don't make anything for women. So it has to be compounded. What kind of supplementation do you recommend for women who are long past menopause and how do you measure clinical deficiencies in these methods? Well, there's an assumption if they're long last, long past menopause, there's an assumption, I mean, we can test, we can do the testing, and we usually do it through Genova testing. Um, the blood tests through the regular labs, I, it, they're not that helpful. Um, there's no question going to be a deficiency because the only estrogen, unless someone has a lot of fat cells, they'll have estrogen uh, in that way. But the adrenals will produce estrogen and, and uh, progesterone, but they're going to have a deficiency. It's a given. Okay. The question is: Is it affecting their health? You know, many women go through menopause and never need any supplementation, and they do fine. Um, but so it really depends on what the symptoms are and whether the, it's appropriate to to supplement them, and what their risk factors are if we do choose to supplement them. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Okay. 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 Yes. What kind of in, what kind of indicators exist where you might look at supplementation? That's sort of part one of the question. Then two, how would you change the answer if you have personal breast cancer history? Mm -hmm. The the symptoms of uh, the obvious symptoms of uh, hormone deficiency um, as far as menopause are the typical you know hot flashes, sleep disturbance, irritability, you know mood disorder, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I actually have, well, if a woman has breast cancer or a strong family history of breast cancer is the question. Um, if someone has breast cancer, I mean, there are physicians that treat with, with estriol and estradiol women that are well out of treatment of breast, you know, in remission right. for many right. years. Um, I haven't done that, um, but there are some that do. Um, we can also, by the way, we can treat T locally, like we can give, it's okay, and I have a whole bunch of research about estriol intravaginally. So it's a, it's a weaker estrogen that can be used intravaginally for symptoms of, of um, vaginal dryness or those kind of symptoms. Um, so I think, you know, the jury's out on whether using estrogen for, now if you read Dr. Mahmoud's book, um, he does actually supplement women that have had breast cancer, so there are physicians who do that. Um, if someone has a family history, then we try to minimize their risks by all the things that I mentioned, 
uh, the indole 3 c the green tea extract, make sure they're eating a plant-based diet, um, lots of exercise. You know, so all of that kind of helps to decrease the risk. Yes? Regarding the omega-3, omega-6 ratio, yes. if you're having a higher intake of omega-3, mm -hmm. No, actually, um, we use, so as far as using omega-3s um, higher doses, there's uh, probably you should be on about 1,000 to 3,000 and maybe even 4,000 uh, uh, milligrams total of DHA and EPA, which are the omega-3s. And um, it's, it's actually used by psychiatrists for mood disorders, you know, at higher doses. Uh, people with cardiovascular disease use higher doses. So there's a, there's a you know, it's a, a large um, range of what can be used. So, yes. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about, and I've referred this, that there's, um, a, there are a variety of different kinds of supplements. So going mm -hmm. to Costco and getting their omega-3 supplements mm -hmm. versus, you know, getting yeah. something. So as far as getting supplements at um, your Costco or, or drugstore or local drugstore, um, uh, I, I think getting a brand that you trust is important. The other complaint that I have in people taking uh, fish oil is that it has a bad taste. Um, so there are many supplements. So for example, and not pushing ours, but you know, we we kind of research what works and we and the companies um, so and if you go to vitamin shop maybe they have their thing or or even um, Whole Foods um, but you you can assume that you're getting the the EPA and DHA in it but it could be a matter of, of um, that it's not good. It's not fun to take because it doesn't taste good, or you, you know. So if you're if you're if it's not good, if you don't enjoy taking it, then you're not going to take it. So finding actually, so some, and then there's vegetarians who don't want to eat fish oil, so they can supplement with flaxseed. So there's very, you know, it's not like you have to do every single one of these things uh, to uh, to minimize your risks, but you know you kind of ha have to individualize it. So flaxseed is another option to get some of your omega threes. So, yes. And you have a really good report on the T three. How much do I take, or what are they? T three thyroid. Mm -hmm. So uh, about the T three thyroid. Okay. So when um, I have a patient that has has the symptoms of low thyroid and. So I'll check the TSH, the free T3, and the free T4. And by the way, the TSH reference ranges have come down. They used to be up to four, you know, 0.5 to 4 point something, and they've actually come down, although it's going to still show up on the, on the lab slip, slip that, it, that up to 4 is okay. But they've actually, really, it should be under 2.5. And preferably, if I'm treat, if somebody has uh, symptoms of low thyroid, I try to keep it under 1.5. So, and the t free T3 should be, the reference range is from 2.3 to 4.2. I try to get it into the higher range. Um, so, so that depends on what the level is. Um, using armor thyroid, something like that, that's 4 to 1, T4 to T3. So you're actually giving both. If you're supplementing with a T3 only, Cytomel, then it, you know, we start with a low dose and kind of check the levels and see what's, you know. So I don't want to overtreat. We don't want to, I don't want to induce hyperthyroidism, which increases risk of osteoporosis. So we don't want to overdo it. So we really do follow the levels. Also, um, I warn people about feeling uh, heart palpitations. You know, if you start to feel heart palpitations or you're jittery, you're on too much. So those are, those are some of the, param the clinical parameters. Did I answer your question? <laughs>